My last physical exam, my primary care doctor's medical assistant came out to get me from the waiting room and prepare me for the doctor. She began by telling me that she would give me three words to remember. After giving me those words, we would cover other areas like my vitals, medication list, etc. And then she would come back and ask me what those three words were. I thought to myself, uh-oh, this is a short memory test, and I hope I pass this one. The words were table, pencil, and sofa. I passed. Unfortunately, the kind of short-term memory that I just shared is not the kind of short-term memory that occurred in this morning's scripture readings. The Israelites in the first reading and some of the laborers in today's gospel probably suffered from a more destructive type of memory loss. And maybe there are times when we do as well. The Israelites have just experienced an incredible deliverance from the false economy of Pharaoh in Egypt. They have miraculously passed through the Red Sea, and they have seen their pursuing enemies drown after they themselves are safely through. Their short-term memory loss causes them to forget what God, through Moses, has done for them. And so they're in the wilderness and they quickly jump to resentment and resort to complaining, whining, and grumbling. Instead of giving thanks for the manna that God provides for them to eat while they are in the wilderness, they look at it and say, what's this stuff? And then there are the laborers in today's parable, a story that Jesus told for a reason. He always told these stories for a reason. They have jobs for which they are probably well paid. They too have been well cared for over their lives, and they have what they need, even though they don't seem to have as much as they want. So instead of giving thanks for what they have and for what has been provided during their lives, they too experience short-term memory loss, and they too jump to resentment, complaining, whining, grumbling. Instead of giving thanks for what they agreed to in advance, they question the benevolence of their landowner for giving those who followed what they too probably needed in order to live a decent life. So what is missing here? If the pervasive attitude so far is resentment, similar to the resentment of the elder son in the parable of the prodigal son, by the way, then what replaces this resentment and what can lead us to a better quality of life? Is it fair for you and me to suggest that there are parallels to the wilderness of the Israelites and the wilderness of COVID-19? Have we perhaps been led out of a false economy of prosperity for some and poverty for others? And now we all find ourselves looking for the promised land that we refer to as the new normal. If we want something better than resentment, what might that be? What might Jesus be suggesting in this challenging parable? Well, how about a little gratitude? I have spent quite a bit of time talking so far about resentment. So let's give gratitude some equal time. Gratitude, I believe, is a spiritual discipline. I believe that gratitude is diametrically opposed to resentment. In other words, the more gratitude, the less resentment. The more resentment, the less gratitude. When we say yes to the discipline of gratitude, I believe that it can transform our lives, especially in challenging times like these. Whenever someone does something kind for us, whether they have to or not, it reminds us that the goodness in them meets the goodness in us. And when that happens, we cannot help but be grateful. 
That is why I remember the day not too long ago that I was standing in line for a cup of coffee. I received my cup of coffee from the cashier who then said to me, there's no charge. The person who was in front of you just paid for it. An undeserved gift from a perfect stranger whom I could not thank because he had already left. But it is still etched in my mind. It's one of those things you don't forget. I attended the General Convention of the Episcopal Church in 1997 in Philadelphia as a deputy from the Diocese of Maine. At that convention, a woman by the name of Julia Chester Emery was canonized by the Episcopal Church. In other words, a day was set aside for her on the Episcopal Church calendar. Her feast day is January 9th, the anniversary of her death in 1922. And I hasten to add that that was 11 years before the birth of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I had to get that in there this morning. Julia helped organize the women of the church to participate in a daily spiritual discipline of gratitude. She asked that everyone remember that when something good happens during the day, this is a gift from God. She suggested that people make a thank offering in gratitude, a tangible thank offering, that all good things come from God. Do any of you remember the blue box? I got introduced to it because my own mother always had one in our house, and I would watch her frequently drop coins into it whenever she was grateful for something, however small. And I have to say my mother did that quite a bit. She was a grateful person. Julia then worked tirelessly to promote gratitude and to support programs of mission and ministry in the Episcopal Church with all the funds that they got collected every year. She worked tirelessly at a time when married women were not allowed to work and had little or no status in the working world. As an aside here, I can't resist thinking that when it comes to the issue of equality for women, Julia Chester Emery and Ruth Bader Ginsburg probably could have made some good trouble together. They both persevered. They really took no for an answer. They truly exemplified grit and faith, both in their professional lives and in their personal lives. Julia's outreach programs were a lot like programs that Mark has recently shared in weekly emails. Grants that Mark has found and uses to help others who are in need because of financial hardships brought about by the wilderness of COVID-19. What Julia Chester Emery did may not seem like much, but serves as the classic example of how many people can do, how many people can do what is seriously, seemingly small, but then collectively can make a big difference in our world. It reminds us of the, of the seemingly small things in our lives for which we can be grateful and then respond accordingly. We can thank the person who made that cup of coffee, the one that I enjoyed that day, the person who said yes to doing that job on that day. Having that kind of gratitude can transform lives. We can thank the people that we work with, for the way that they support us. We can thank grocery store cashiers and clerks, as well as healthcare workers who put their lives on the line every day to keep people like you and me safe. And what a great alternative that can be if we compare it to the resentment of those Israelites in the wilderness or those laborers who resented the generosity of a landowner who shared his bounty with those people who showed up late, but at least showed up. Maybe the lesson that we can potentially learn from our Lord's parable is simply that God's economics 
differ from our economics. The prophet Isaiah once said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your, your ways my ways, says the Lord. Some of you may be familiar with a poem called Desiderata, which begins with the words, go placidly amid the noise and the haste. Later on in that poem is a line that may give those disgruntled laborers in the parable some helpful food for thought. It says, if you compare yourselves with others, you may become vain or bitter, for there will always be persons greater and lesser than yourself. In any case, the spiritual practice of gratitude far exceeds the debilitating practice of resentment. And I must confess that the movement away from resentment toward the virtue of gratitude is still part of my journey. There continue to be steps forward and then steps backward as I too persevere in resisting evil, falling into sin, and repenting and returning to the Lord with God's help. Simply put, when it comes to resentment, we are better than this because God is better than this and God dwells in all of us. So I give thanks that God's economics, the economy of unconditional love and grace for all, far exceeds my own standards of economics, conditional love and grace for some and not for others. And so I close with the conclusion of Desiderata as part of my personal creed as we move forward toward the new normal of COVID-19 and as I strive to be a more grateful and less resentful person. Keep peace in your soul with all its sham drudgery, and broken dreams, it is still a beautiful world. Be cheerful. Strive to be happy. That ought to keep me busy for a while. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>